Welcome to the Mike Caudill Podcast. I'm Mike Caudill, and today we are getting right after it. Harrison, there's no waiting today, dude. We're bringing you on to start the show right off the top. Oh, he's serious, guys. The hat's on backwards. Hat, Mike hat's on backwards. Okay. And and I see you've got your FitFo hat on. I've got my FitFo hat. I am rocking the FitFo because this week has been a FitFo week. <laughs> dude, every week's a FitFo week. Yeah. It is, the, it is, but that's what makes it fun. And that, uh, absolutely, we do have really good jobs. Um, for those that are watching the Mike Caudill podcast for the first time and you don't know what FitFo is, let's not tell them. Let's encourage them to go to the website. Um, so if you yes. go to it's it's Mike Caudill, you click under apparel. Um, I don't know if we even have it described on the website, so maybe we do need to tell people. But your hat, tell everybody what your hat stands for. My hat stands for figure it the f out that's right we are a pc pg-13 uh yes. podcast for the kids uh, listening fit foe, fit foe is like that what was it glenn gary glenn ross always be closing cl closing a b c's but ours is fit foe because on the other side of the podcast and the tv work that we do at the agency side with driven 360 Fitfo is is a term that came out of one of our client meetings where uh, Jay Sinclair on our team, he was with the client and they both looked at each other and they were like, dude, those people, they need to figure it the F out. And we were like, <gasps> we're going to put it on a hat and a shirt. Yeah. It's like our creed. You know what I mean? Every driven client has one now. In fact, you know what? I'm so bummed. I don't have mine here today or I would put it on. I'm gonna work next, pod, next podcast, um, yes. dude. We've got a we've got a killer show today, which is why you're on. No monologues today, man. There is so much automotive news. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time to the Mike Caudill podcast, we try and cover off on the the news of the industry first. And this week is a big, big news week. Uh, Monday started out slow, uh, and as we've made our way through the the week, man, there is a ton to talk about. So. Uh, outside of Harrison's agenda, I've got an agenda uh, right here. And we always know Harrison has an agenda. Um, always, always. It, What's always. happening to yours? Let's get in the news. Let's get it. Let's here we it. go. So so coming off the top, we're going to talk about NASCAR um, and the race this last weekend in Atlanta. Yep. We're going to talk about Red Bull Racing versus Jim Farley. Um, this is actually a big story. Um, we'll get into that. Uh, two big pieces of news this week. So Consumer Reports, which has been the gold standard since I was a kid, uh, has announced their top 10 new vehicles for 2024. Um, and then the Top Safety Pick Awards, which is IIHS, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, uh, they have announced America's safest cars. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we got a little bit of fun. Um, we're not going to interview him this week, but we're going we're gonna to break into the, the fun with a little bit of news uh, from Subaru this week. Yeah. Uh, and then next week we'll have Dominic Infante on with Subaru to talk about it. Uh, and then we've got some EV news, uh, some news that kind of broke this week. We're going to actually give you guys uh, the EVs with, as of as we sit today, with the best range. And that's a question that always comes up. Yes. So no doom and gloom this week. Go ahead. Yes, I'm with no you. Doom. No, no doom, doom and, and gloom. gloom. Although there is still plenty of doom and gloom. <laughs> um the RV season is around the corner. If you know, uh, you know me. You know I love to RV, so we're going to get into RVing. Talk a little bit about that. And our guest today uh, will be no other than Monica Geraci, who is with the RV Industry Association Go RVing. She's their spokesperson, director of marketing, PR, just an overall awesome person, and a, and a recent Texan. Um, mm. Yeah, moved from that's uh, exciting Virginia to Texas. Uh, awesome. And then we're going to close it out with a couple different things. Uh, as RV season is upon us, uh, we're going to talk about gearing up for the season. And this will be a theme over the next few podcasts, talk about some products out there that consumers might want to get their hands on. Uh, and then Mike's Ride of the Week. Ooh, I'm going to make you wait. I'm excited I'm for that. If I said, if I said Irish flair with Italian design, <laughs> would you be able to figure it out? Um, yes. I will so throw really out really one little that. I will throw out one little Easter egg for the ride of the week. Guys, it's five hundred and five horsepower. It's a lot of horsepower. Five hundred and five horsepower. Okay, so I'm gonna have a crazy piece of trivia for you. I will do this on social media at some point this week. Tracy will flip out 
when producer Tracy will flip out when I share this with you guys. We gotta, we need to bring on producer Ruth and producer Tracy at some point. They need to. We do. We do. They need some spotlights. We need, we need, we need, well, obviously we need some people better looking than us to be on the show. <laughs> yeah. We need some, let me tell spotlight. you, I mean, if, if I, I need to get my hair purple and then yeah. I'll match producer. Yeah. If we don't get the light on them soon, them sitting in the dark, they're going to be pale like vampires. Like, they're going to be need super some pale. Light on them. And, yeah. and by the way, producer Ruth has a sister. She's not producer Grace. It's just Ruth and Grace, but they have their own podcast and we're going to let them do a shout out. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have Ruth come on and Sweet. talk about her podcast. I don't think she wants to do it. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're, uh, we'll close out with the ride of the week and then some eats because we always do that. Yes. And uh, I've been home for two weeks. So that's going to be an interesting, it's going to be local, local food. Might talk about the lime deli and my mm. pulled turkey sandwich. Cold turkey? What the hell? Dude, it's okay. money. It's I'm money. I know. We'll have to wait. This. We'll have yeah. to wait on that one for then. All right. So here okay. we go, you guys. We're gonna kick it off. Um, did Did you watch the race last weekend? Did you get to I, check it? I caught highlights of it. I saw this giant crash that happened. Apparently, not like that's new and you know in NASCAR. But so what happened? Giant crash. So <laughs> for NASCAR, for me, so I've loved NASCAR my whole life. Like I've got Jeff Gordon's victory celebration over here. Um, it's a, it's a die cast winner circle car. Um, I didn't grow up going to NASCAR, but when I went to college, one of my roommates was a massive NASCAR and NHRA fan, Matt Scroggins, Oakdale, okay. California in the house. And I started going to NASCAR races. Right. Absolutely fell in love with it. I remember watching, um, Richard Petty as a kid. I remember watching some of the big names, you know, spin around the track. Dale Earnhardt senior, you know, was always, ah, he can't, he can't win the Daytona 500. And so I always start the season off the same. Boom. You watch Daytona start to finish. Yeah. And then you go, it, usually we go to California, right? So California Speedway, um, but the, the track is under renovation. They ripped the whole track down. It's going to be a road course. Um, so this year they're going to Atlanta. It was the first time they were at Atlanta for track track uh, race number two this season. Right. And if there's one thing about Atlanta Motor Speedway is that, dude, you can get four or five wide. And it is a fast track and it is a slippery track. It is spring, winter, spring, and you're going into the Southeast on a track. And it is mm -hmm. just like, so there were 37 drivers that started the race. 27 of those 37 were all involved in crashes. 10 Holy. drivers in total, 10 drivers made it through, uh, without crashing. And, and that was a pretty big deal. Um, Everyone's excited at the winner. No one anticipated that Daniel Suarez uh, would end up being the winner of the race. I think Hendrick Motorsports, I think their top finishing driver was like 15th. Like it was, mm. Logano was out. Like, they, dude, they all went down. Like Chase Elliott was out. Like it just Denny Hammond, like all these drivers just, do -douche, do -douche. and some of them were finishing the race after having been in crashes. But um, what made this race fun this year was literally the last lap. You had a photo finish where three cars crossed the line, and it was one of those like they had to go to replay to determine who was going to win it was this that race. Close. Yeah, it was yeah. that close. So that's, exciting, that's off the that's Daniel. Kind. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and NASCAR, man, I love NASCAR. Um, I know people want to bitch about the fact that it's just cars going around in a circle, but when you get into the science of it, right, how much gasoline you're putting in at the time, what's the tire pressure, what's the temperature outside, like make, they, you know, making adjustments to the car while drivers in the car, having the driver provide input. There's a spotter on top of the racetrack. I don't know if you've ever been to the, if you've ever, you know, put on earphones and listen to, you know, the track, you know, the actual track monitor right, for each right. team. But it's so cool, man. You can actually listen to the communication between the spotter and the pit crew with the driver. And so it's the craziest thing. NASCAR is violent. Vroom, vroom, right. vroom, like cars and spinning. But the spotter up at top, they're commuting, communicating with the driver the whole way around the track. Here's what it sounds like. Left side, left side, driver coming right, driver coming right, left side, left side, down force break right side like it's the calmest thing this guy's in his ear and you know the driver's as calm as he can going at 145 miles an hour 150 miles like it's the coolest thing right right when the communication level is that high it needs to be clear and it needs to be precise it's uh, kind of it, like in the military too you know you you see these guys that talk about doing comms over radio when they're in yeah. battle it's the same thing you know everything needs to be direct and precise and calm yeah because 
that's how you, you know, stop people from freaking out. It's just, it's no yeah. different than, you know, well, no different than racing and combat, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, racing and combat. I mean, two great comparisons, <laughs> but uh, communication yeah. is everything. And, and it, it's just fun to watch how these guys do this. You know, they showed the spoilers between Daytona and Atlanta. So what most people think is that these cup cars just go to every track and, Hey guys, let's go race. No, there are no. tons of changes. So the spoiler was like this at Daytona, but in Atlanta, it was like this. So think about the airflow comes up over the top, over the cars in Daytona. And the reason you have so many crashes is the spoiler is like this. It's taking the air, dropping it down under the hood and lifting cars, right? So these cars are, there are points when the cars are inches apart from one another, like this on the track. And, you know, one false move and you're taking out 20 guys. Agreed. It's crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of things that go into the equation too. You know, it's, they take into consideration, you know, sea level, they take into consideration tire pressure, suspension changes. You're right. I mean, every track is different every and you can different. only do so much to actually tune, <laughs> but that driver error is always another thing. And, you know, it's always it's there. So and what most people don't know, it's fast pace. And what speaking of fast pace, most people don't know this is that when you are halfway through a race, there is a whole team at your transporter and they are loading it up on Sunday. Like they get there on Thursday, they offload, they get cars out, they get in the garage, they get their tools. They get and then there's a point on Sunday when they start loading these transporters up. It's a process. The yeah. minute the race is done, the car is loaded on. They have secondary cars on these. And if they, if they need a third car, they then got to go back to Mooresville, South Carolina or North Carolina, pick up a car, load another car and hit the road. Usually what happens is, is all these guys, if you're ready to roll, they will load a car up, uh, your cars up, your two transporters, and they will hit the road as a, as a full on, you know, group of NASCAR drivers, uh, and, and teams. And they will, you know, basically roll all the way across. I can't find the word. What's it? They will carpool, not carpool. What's the word I'm looking for? Well, it's like a, you know, they can like congregate, you know what I mean? Congregate. Just this, yeah, this huge line. Either. We'll figure it so, out. They're, they're almost like, you know, like a band of rock stars, you know, that, traveling from concert Well, everyone's taking concert. pictures, right? Yeah. Everyone's yeah. taking pictures. I remember seeing Jimmy Johnson's rig go by and I was like, oh, it's Jimmy Johnson. He's got a race car in there. But they will then, so this week they're hauling ass from Atlanta to yeah. Las Vegas, right? So this, wow. the race, in, race ends on Sunday and they are like, boom, we're gone. Now imagine what happened in Daytona. Race was yeah. on Monday because of a rain delay on set on Sunday. So yeah. they, you know, now fortunately it was just boom, Daytona to Atlanta, have parts shipped down that are needed from North Carolina and Mooresville. But this week, you know, they, they boom straight up to Mooresville, reload the rig. And they are already today's what Wednesday. Dude, they're some of the teams might already be in Las Vegas. Yeah. Like it's that fast and people don't see that kind of stuff. It's really cool just to follow, you know, the science of NASCAR. It's so fun. Yeah, and think about how many people it takes to keep that train moving, you know, guy ordering parts, guy getting lunch for everybody, you know, guy's got the truck ready, get the trailer ready, get the car in there, make sure everybody's there, count their heads. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that goes yeah. into logistics of You're only as good team. as your last sponsor, man. It's so crazy. <laughs> True. Uh, speaking of racing, um, this broke on Friday, Harrison, and it's going to be real interesting to see how this rolls downhill. Um, the Associated Press obtained a letter uh, from Ford Motor Company CEO Jim Farley mm -hmm. to Christian Horner, Christian Horner, the president of Rebel Racing, Oracle Rebel Racing, and it said, we need an answer. And apparently he had sent another letter 11 days before with no answer. And here's the scoop. Ford Motor Company has learned that there are allegations of executive mismanagement at Rebel Racing. So what does all of that mean? And what's interesting is it started out as a allegation of Christian and the whole team, management team, just being pricks to everybody within the organization. Wow. But that then turned into sexual allegations, and there's wow. no answer. You're innocent until proven guilty, but Jim Farley's letter says straight up, uh, this is not how Ford Motor Company rolls. So because this is not how Ford Motor Company rolls, you have to essentially get your ducks in a row and provide us with an answer. 
Yeah, I mean, Jim's doing the right thing too. You know, he's trying to protect everything that Ford's built, and they made it very clear. Look, if this is going on, we need answers. We can't be a part of this, and we don't condone Correct. it. Correct. You know, you need Correct. to let us know what's you know communicate. The line of communication is open. Just tell right. us what's going on. That's so it. it and, makes and, me wonder. You know. Well, of course, and and I think part of the thing that makes this interesting is the fact that, you know, by twenty twenty six. Ford Motor Company has signed a deal, right? They're the official engine partner. And in 2026 is when Ford's engine program is to be implemented into full race car performance, right? Right. right. And so <clears throat> is this a reason, is Ford backing out, right? Is this a, well, <laughs> you know, there's some things going on or are there really things going on? Look, Crazy I won't time. take that off the table, you know, because you're right. These are some really interesting times. Uh, but you know, we, 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 we've got to consider all angles. I'll give you that. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, that's a big deal for both brands, you know, it is, it is. So keep an eye. We'll keep an eye on that one. If anything breaks free on it, but I thought that was interesting yeah. kind of news. Um, yeah. speaking of, speaking of other news, um, again, thanks for joining the Mike Caudill podcast. One of the, one of the biggest questions I always get Harrison yeah. is, what car should I get? This morning I had an offsite meeting, and um, once we got through the business of what we needed to talk to, um, you know, this person said, "All right, I've got a Jeep. Should I get a Bronco? Right? Mm. I've got." And then, should I get a Bronco Raptor or should I get a three ninety two? And it's I, every day I get asked, you know, my recommendations on cars, and and so it just kind of interesting that it falls in line with. You know, Consumer Reports, which is the gold standard, has been the gold standard for years. Yes. Uh, Consumer Reports announces, you know, its top 10 new vehicles. And something most people don't know about Consumer Reports. Now, this may have changed. Um, I cannot validate this only of what from what I heard, you know, 10 years ago working in the industry that Consumer Reports does not. They buy all their cars for long term testing. They want no bias, right? Oh, hey, test our car, Mazda, right? Like they want no bias. So they go out and they buy all their own cars and then they do their tests on them. So if you're if you're somebody in the market for a new vehicle, I'm going to give you some interesting factoids around So I'm not going to list them all out. You got to go check out the article. But the number one, the highest number within that 10 yep. uh, for the first, for the, for 2024, are hybrids hybrids are leading the pack that's exciting add on yeah not only and one electric vehicle made it so one of one of 10 is electric but here's here's kind of what's interesting so of the hybrids leading the pack toyota has four picks wow. um number two surprised me because if you look at if you look at toyota right toyota how many, I mean, I don't know if I can name every car that they have, you know, it's Prius, yeah. right? Tundra, like you just start Camry, Corolla, yeah. Prius, yeah. like, I, you know, I'll lose track after five cars. Uh, but the second is Subaru, right? You, Subaru Ascent, Subaru Crosstrek, Subaru Outback, like Subaru WRX. Okay, I'm done. Um, <laughs> BRZ, wait, hold on. I, now I'm done. Um, Forrester. <laughs> Forrester, okay, there's another. Yep, yep. Producer Tracy, are we missing anything? No, I think we got him. She's not listening. <laughs> um, all right, so Subaru comes in at number two. Surprising that this company will not only be on my consumer, the Consumer Reports top 10, but it will also be included in the IIHS uh, Top Safety Pick Award is Mazda. Yeah. Dude, I'm telling you right now, watch out for Mazda. They are absolutely... I just, dude, I saw a CX-90. Man, it was friggin' beautiful. A CX-90 is awesome. Uh, a lot of people that I've talked, which by the way, you and I need to work on getting one, okay? Because I don't know if you saw the comments when we did our best three-row SUV so far in 2024. Some guy commented and he's like, why not CX-90? And I'm like, dude. We'd love right, to have one. CX ninety. We're gonna go. We're gonna go we, get a we've CX ninety. We've got to get. We're gonna one. get a CX yeah. ninety. You know. So let me tell you real quick before we uh, switch gears here. One of the reasons why. Well, two reasons why I like it. One. This is a joke. This is a no, joke. Not at all. No. Okay. One. Serious. It looks very BMW esque. Oh, it's not does. exactly like an X seven. Mm -hmm. Kind of like between, 
like between an X5 coupe and an X7. It's just got this nice look to it in the back, you know, huge broad shoulders, everything like that. The second thing I like, this thing is pretty quick. It's got a twin turbo inline six. I mean, that's kind of impressive, especially for Mazda. Yeah, I think they're about ready to make a big, big turn, right? I the, one of the so it's funny. Years ago, when I was in the world of automotive PR, my first job was with Ford Motor Company, Lincoln Mercury. Yep. Lincoln, yep. When I say Mercury, that outdates me. You probably weren't even born when Mercury <laughs> was a brand. Hey, I um, have one. Okay, remember? I, I know. <laughs> Tread We're light. talking about the, the land yacht. The um, land yacht. Yep. The land yacht, but. Um, I went and worked at Mazda for about two years and yeah, there's so much passion behind that brand, man. If you are a, most people, are, hey, Mazda, Yada, what are you? <laughs> and I'm like, man, most, most car enthusiasts love to drive the Miata yes. rear wheel drive manual gearbox. It's lightweight, man. You could put that thing on a track with a HKS or Gretty turbocharger with some blown exhaust. And that thing's yeah. fun. It's, it's a go-kart. I can tell you too, that even at the base level of Mazda owners, like they are really super loyal to that brand. Like They're my loyal. wife's best friend has literally leased every generation of Mazda three from like the first one to the most current one. Yeah. And she just doesn't consider any other car. They're just, yeah. they're just loyal. And for good reason, I, they're great cars. When I started dating my wife, um, you know, it was like, Hey, I can help get you a car at cost. Of course. And I got, yeah. we got our Mazda tribute, man. And she rocked that Mazda tri tribute. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We, we a rocked the tribute. Isn't you that want to hear a crazy that? story? Yeah, you want to yeah. hear a crazy unrelated, yeah. but related car story. I'll yes. make it really fast. Yeah. Yeah. So I had bought my wife when we first were dating a year or two and I bought her a little teeny tiny diamond necklace. Like it, you know, it was probably I probably got it at Kmart or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> we all I start somewhere. It's all I don't good. know. It's I started good. somewhere. But I got her this necklace and the necklace was lost. She's like, I can't mm. find it anywhere. Like, I know Shoot. I had it on. I took it off when I went to go to the gym and I can't find it. And so uh, search car, search your house, search your bags. It was gone for like a week. And she backed out of our, we lived in a townhouse in Mission Viejo, California. She backed out of the garage and she started to drive down the street. Now, mind you, when I say drive down the street, it was... It was 30 yards away, like football yards away. Sure. And as she started to drive down the street, I saw hanging from her step bar, like her little step bar to get in the car. <laughs> I saw yeah. something shot. Like I just caught a blink of a shine. Right. Like the sun caught it. And you're like, wait. The sun <laughs> caught that diamond at the right yeah, point. And yeah. I, I immediately called her and I'm like, stop your car. <laughs> and she pulled over at the very, like it was a long hill. She pulled over and I'm running down behind her car. And she, she's like, what, what? And I'm like, don't move. And I went down and untangled it. It, it basically looped, you know, because you have two fixtures yeah. that come down that hold it to the car. Yeah. And it had looped around that fixture and was hanging there. And I went like this and I held it up to her. And she's like, oh my God, <laughs> I got the necklace. I mean, that's the first piece of jewelry Dude, I bought hilarious, her. that's hilarious, man. She still has it, it today. It just winked at you in the sun, you know what I mean? You just were Dude, looking. it winked at me. <laughs> All That's right, so, so we've got consumer reports with the top cars. Now, yeah. if you have a top car, what's more important, having the top car that Consumer Reports picks or the safest car on the market? I'm going to have my bets and say the safest car on the market because, you know, safety is paramount, <laughs> as we like to say it here. Depends. <laughs> it <Yeah>. depends. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a car enthusiast, you're like, I don't care about safety. I just want a horse. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, that's true. I want a manual gearbox. Uh, so listen to this. So the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, every year they release their top safety pick awards. 71 cars qualified. 49, 49 won the top safety pick. But they have something called the top safety pick plus, which adds in like nighttime front crash avoidance, like better headlights. And the criteria this year were more stringent than in any other year to receive this award. So 22 cars took home the top safety plus award. The number of the, so the winners are really interesting to me. So the number one takeaway winner and it's interesting because they they're combining all the brands which i kind of think is not fair yeah hyundai kia and genesis combined for six top safety 
Pick Plus Awards. Okay. Mazda, this is the shit. Mazda, <laughs> five awards in the top safety plus. Like, okay. are you freaking kidding me? Okay. Mazda only has five cars. Yeah. And they and they and every one of them made it. Like, <laughs> hey. that is awesome. So um, they had five plus awards. Uh, Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis had six plus award six awards. I keep saying plus. It's six top uh, top safety plus awards. Hyundai took home 16 awards in total. So among all its brands, it took home 16 awards. Toyota took home 13 awards, and that combines top safety pick awards with top safety plus awards. So okay. combines the two together. And then uh, I, I just know, every, I feel like every time I say this brand, it just makes producer Tracy and, and producer uh, Ruth just so excited because Ruth has a BRZ. <laughs> And yep. uh, Tracy has, I don't know. We have Tracy and Outback, Crosstrek. I don't Cross know track, which I one think, it is. Right? I'm pretty sure it's it's like that cool looking blue one. I just love yeah. to I just love to give her a hard time. I'm like, is that an Aztec? She's like, no, it's a Crosstrek. <laughs> um, she doesn't want an Aztec. Um, but Subaru, dude, comes in. They win four awards. And, of course, after I said, oh, Subaru wins four awards. And then Tracy was like, hey, just so you know. Well, it was more like, hey, just so you know. <laughs> um Subaru sits at 71 total awards since 2013. Holy. No other automaker has more top safety pick awards than Subaru. There you go, Tracy. Producer Tracy, Woo! let the gloating begin. It's amazing. <laughs> um, did you see their new commercial? I think Tracy wants to say something. No, I haven't seen their new commercial. Is it dog related? Uh, if no. it's dog related, it'll sell to my wife. <laughs> I will. T no, I will tell you it's probably the most impactful car commercial uh, that I've ever seen. Um, the commercial is a car crash with police and ambulance lights, and you can see the ambulance in the distance and the cars rolled over on its side. The airbags mm -hmm. are deployed and it's the car. And then they're, as they're backing out, a guy is walking this way and it's a husband and he walks over to his wife and daughter sitting on the curb. And you know, the, the first words out of his mouth are, um, thank God you're alive. Right. Wow. And you know, it immediately pans to the Subaru. And they make a comment about how the fact that, you know, the Subaru's safe and they'll only own Subarus. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, I, I always go back to it, right? I, for the first time ever, my long, ridiculously long career uh, in the auto industry, I'd yet to real, like do a real test drive with a Subaru. And I've done two tests in the last year. And I, you know, I've fallen in love with the brand. I think the brand is so, so awesome to be a part of. I agree. Um, and it, and it is, you know, uh, don't get involved in the politics of the car world and don't become that brand person. But, you know, <clears throat> given the fact that they've contributed more than $75 million to the, you know, the national parks, I mean. Yeah, I was just about to say, too, as you sip on that delicious beverage. Uh, it's kombucha. <laughs> Mm, there you go. No, oh, no mushroom coffee today? No shroom uh, coffee? No, that was earlier. <laughs> I didn't know I had to. Okay. No, uh, they, they've done a lot of philanthropy, Subaru. And, um, they're, you know, like you said, big on national parks. They're big on dogs. Like they are just – their whole brand is about, you yeah. know, appealing to dogs or pets in yeah. general, but dogs yeah. uh, especially. And that's that's good, man. That, you know, that resonates with people. It resonates with all Americans across, you know. Their good cars stuff. are capable. Don't forget that. Yeah. Capable, yeah. Oh, safe. Well, that kind of goes without saying. Yeah. And most important, they're actually affordable. If I could be an automotive designer, I would just change up the looks a little bit. Like I, I would mm. just, I'm not sure how I would do it, but I would just change up the looks a little bit. Um, yeah. Can we real stink quick? Guy, we, stink guy from Tracy. Well, let's talk about guy. the 2025 Forester. You've seen it, obviously. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Because look, go look at a 2024, right? Then go look at a 2025. You're like, this is like a different car completely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think what's interesting, Harrison, is it from 2024 to 2025, I think you have a lot of automakers that are, they've really gone to push the envelope on changing the way the brand looks, right? Yeah. You look at, you look at the new Toyota Land Cruiser. You look at the Lexus GX 550, right? That yeah. GX 550 is so un-Lexus, but God, it is beautiful. Then you look at the all-new Hyundai Santa Fe. It's all squared out and boxy. Um, it's you know interesting. I love them too. I love boxy I SUVs. I'm trying to get Taylor to go look at a new Santa Fe. Taylor's my wife. For those of you listening, 
Um, <laughs> but she's <laughs> she's on the fence about it. She she has cars other other cars in mind. But I digress. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you don't need to digress because I think you're right. And and you know the beauty the beauty in this podcast is we just segue off into topics that people care about. And I think when we start talking yeah. about cars and car culture, uh, interestingly enough, is as you talk about the Subaru, um, I'm going to tell you two cars that are it's not bad or good. Um, I will say that I think the new Telluride that just came out, I think they went away from the coolness of the original Telluride and it's become more vanilla. Um, so if yeah. you haven't looked at the new 2025 Kia Telluride, I think that there's a little bit of awesomeness that they may have lost with the new design. But with that said, the new EV90 is sick. It is. Uh, it actually, wow. Is. I'm not even going to front. I'm not even going to yeah. front. It is freaking cool looking. And yeah. the fact that it's a three row EV, I mean, three that's, row. it's almost kind of like a conundrum when you think about it. Cause you're it like, is. Hey, we have this giant vehicle. That's EV. You're like, wait a second. Yeah. Giant vehicles don't get good gas or get you yeah. know, <laughs> good. Mileage it is, it is. Yeah. but don't Google the starting price because you're going to be like, wait, hold on. I know. What? I know. I gotta I've know. I gotta know. Talk, talk about something Harrison. Cause I gotta know what the price is of the Kia. EV9. Well, I, gotta, I gotta Google this. Look, it's gonna be more than you want to spend, but then you look at it and you see how cool it is, and you're like, okay, well, for, hold on a second, I get seventy five hundred off of it because of the you know federal tax rebate for EVs. Not so true. Now it's gonna be this. Not price. true. You not don't. For this one? No. It no. It it it. The key is not in that top nineteen. Oh, you're right. You're right. The new parameters yeah. that came out. The new parameters that came I out January one. Key is not parameters. in. No, you're right about that. So. We'll the starting kind of price the of the new EV9 is 54900 but that's for a base, base, base model. I looked at their their top of the line at the show in Chicago, and it was like 70 or 80 something. It was it was up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not it a cheap there. car by any means. Mike, that it's brings not. me to a good question, though. I want to ask you, because you've, you know, you've got your ear to the ground on vehicle purchases, stuff like that. When you're talking to people, and they're talking about specific car they want to buy, and then they start to get into the trims, how many people do you think that buy new cars are buying base model trims because of the price or just because of the value they get? Because as we know, base model vehicles, the standard of vehicles now, they come with a lot more than they did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Every automaker is different. Uh, you're never yeah. going to buy. I've never met a single person on this planet that's bought a stock Ford F-150. Yeah, Not I haven't either. Single one, right? Yeah. Whereas if you buy a stock Subaru Crosstrek, it's going to be pretty well equipped, right? Yeah. It's going to, I mean, it's going to have certain things on it. And you look at Toyota and Nissan, right? Toyota's safety sense comes standard. Yeah. Um, all of Nissan's safety features come standard, yeah. right? So base vehicles are now getting a lot more bells and whistles than they did in the past. Um, I wanted to point out one car before we jump off the, the car topic. So I, I talked a little bit about this last week, but we're talking about car design. Yeah. And at the at the Chicago Auto Show last week, um, or two weeks ago when I was there, you know, Ford brought the new Explorer. And I mentioned this, I, I think I mentioned it on podcasts. If I didn't, uh, I know it's on some of my sh social stuff. So we're talking about exterior design. The new Explorer is relatively unchanged for the new year. So the exterior design is not changed, only with some small accents and that's by design so ford went out and they did a bunch of study groups they did a bunch of you know research yep. and and marketing branding and brought a whole bunch of people in to comment on the explorer and everyone said they loved the exterior design so they did minimal changes on the exterior but the interior is completely overhauled the seats I, you can go check it out on on it's mike caudill's my social pages the seats are the so softest and most comfortable i ever sat in 13 yeah. inch massive infotainment screen over the air the updates and the new explorer comes with ford's blue cruise hands-free technology i mean it's awesome it's pretty awesome yeah i think ford made the exact changes that were needed to that vehicle because yeah, it, it really is a good looking car and the fact that it's now on that rear wheel drive platform standard it just makes it the is. car so much more comfortable like we it test is. drove a front wheel drive platform version so one of the older generations uh compared it to the newest one 
and we're just like this is just night and day in terms of yeah. comfort quality or you know everything just ride experience yeah. overall yeah it's an awesome car yeah and i told you from my 2017 ford raptor to my <laughs> 2024 ford raptor yeah. um so yeah. gen 2 to gen 3 massive difference just the quality Huge. of the ride the yeah. technology it, it's it's a different beast um all right so it's time to have a little bit of fun i uh, stumbled on this on the news this week and uh, if you haven't had a chance i mentioned earlier dominic infante uh, director of corporate communications for uh, product communications for subaru is going to join us next week he'll be our special guest um we're going to talk a little bit about this and then we're going to talk about what's coming up at the new york auto show um so subaru files through the u.s patent office for 12 names that will either be trim levels or model names for vehicles. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if or. you have a list of huh? <laughs> trim levels or model or. names. Yeah. So I think we can figure out, let's see if we could, let, let's, tr we got to write this down. We got to write it, write it down. And I'm going to, I'm going to grab, let me grab a pen. I got to do this Go because we're going to be on with Dominic next week. And if he tips our hat to anything, we're going to know. Yeah. So I, I have the you. list in front of me, by the way. All right. So first up is Trail Seeker. Yep. Is that going to be a model or is it going to be a trim? See, that's the thing. It could go either way. Trail Seeker. You know, that's kind of almost like it's kind of like Ford's goat mode, you know, go anywhere train. It's like right. go over any train, excuse me. I, I feel like Trail Seeker. I feel like that's a trim level. All right, Harrison says trim level. Yeah. Mike says model line. Because that's close to, well, because it's close to Trailblazer. It's close to. I'm going with, I'm going with the new Subarak Trail Seeker. Subarak? This, the new <laughs> Subaru Trail Seeker. <laughs> that's okay. That's, we're keeping that in there. How about <laughs> Uncharted? I definitely feel like that's a vehicle line for sure. That's a new model. A model? The Subaru Uncharted? Yeah. That's a trim level. You think so? Okay. So I we're say kind trim of on level. Opposite ends right now. Harrison that's okay. says that's model fine. line. I love it. We're totally not on. Ever pass. That's a trim level. I say trim so level. Yeah, because it's close to like Everglades, you know? That's definitely trim level. All right. I'm writing this down. Tailwind. Tailwind. Wait, you skipped one. Outsider. Out Outsider. That's a model. Outback, Outsider. The Subaru Crosstrek Outsider. Well, that could be a trim. Why would you I think it could be a patent outsider? Nobody wants to be an outsider. That's but, just crazy. Well, okay, maybe I'm saying the quiet Check part out loud. My outsider. <laughs> maybe I'm saying the quiet part out loud, but uh I say that never crazy. sees the light of, I say that never sees the light of day. Well, that's yeah, I know. That's the thing too. Is that not right, you say that too? You say that too. Falls yeah. on the yeah. Falls on the cutting table. Okay. Yeah. Viewfinder. Viewfinder. The Subaru view. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Like through Nikki a camera, like holding, like holding like a view. DSLR. It's like, yeah. Woo. Viewfinder. Um, I mean, I kind of get it. That's a trim. Because there's no way. Because I, I see what they're implying. Like, hey, go out there and find views. You know, I get it. But that's more of a trim. I think. They're going to come out with a new model line and they're going to call it the getaway. And then it, it's going to be, or maybe it's going to be the outsider. And then you're going to have a trim level called the viewfinder and the okay. getaway. Okay. So it'd be like, am I equating this correct when I say it's almost like a, like a Denali lineup where it's, you know, kind of there. Maybe. Like, uh, yeah, maybe. Okay. So you got getaway, you got high road, you got ever guide. You got high trail. High trail is a great trim level. Yep. Or the Subaru high trail. I was thinking oh. high country, you know? Do you know what the high trail is? Dude. I think I know where you're going with this, but I want to hear you say it. It's their truck. Yeah. I was going to say either truck That's or the name like of their truck. a three row. Like a bigger three row than the- This uh, is their truck, accent. the high trail. And the trailhead is a trim. Yeah. The, the high trail trailhead. You can't have trail trail. No. So it's either going to, I think both could be the truck, the trailhead. No, high trail. Mm. I know. Kind of a conundrum. The last one is accomplice. Yeah, I, I saw that. Accomplice to my, I don't know. Like, how, I don't even know how to feel about that. Yeah, just <laughs> the throw accomplice. that one on the table. 
Oh, yeah. dude, you've got Trailhead and you've got, I think High Trail is the, is the name of the, it's going to be called the Subaru High Trail. I do too. And yeah. Trailhead sounds like a really badass trim. It does. It does. Yeah. Um, all right, dude, that's a little bit of fun. Uh, comment, everyone. Let us know what your thoughts are on this. Um, all right. So interestingly enough, man, we're just rolling through news today, Harrison. There's just so much to cover off yeah. on. I'm going to try and speed this up a little bit or else there's going to be a lot of editing <laughs> Into today's <laughs> producer segment. Tracy's going to be in your ear. EV news of the week. I saw this just an interesting article. I see cars, which uh, is a homologator of content online. Yep. Uh, and it was on KTLA's webpage. Which EVs have the best range? And in the SUV category, it's the Fisker Ocean with 360 miles, followed by the Model X and the Model Y from Tesla. Model X at 348, Model Y at 330. Small cars. The BMW Model 3 or i3 is at 358 miles. Dude, that's a mm. lot. And then yeah. you've got the Chevy Bolt um, at 259, the BMW i4 at 307. Dude, I got to tell you right now, that Fisker at 360 and uh, that Chevy Bolt at 259 because – and then let me just look. What are luxury cars? Mercedes-Benz EQS 350, that's over 100 grand. Tesla Model S. Uh, BMW i7 321. Dude, those are all six-figure cars. Right. Maybe right. the Model S you can get under that. So if you look at this, you go, all right, if I want to buy an electric car and I want something affordable, although you don't see the Nissan Leaf on here because of the range and it's going away next year, um, we can't, we can't, kind of can't count that. So you look at this, you go, all right, Fisker and the Ocean is a 30,000 in the thir mid-30s entry-level yep. vehicle that you can, of course, scale up. You've got the Model X and the Model Y, which are both pricey. Yep. Then you've got the Chevy Bolt, which is right around thirty grand, and then you've got the Model Three and the I Four. So the Chevy Bolt's the most affordable out of all of them, followed Correct. by the Fisker Three Sixty, or followed by the Fisker Ocean. Not that's not much rocket science on my end, man. I know which one I'd be getting. Oh yeah, for sure. Me too. Um. All right, dude. You know what time of year it is, right? What time of year is it? RV season. So funny. I Almost. just got I just got an email too about that. That was so funny. And I was like, huh, is this Mike planning something in my inbox? <laughs> I know, right? Overland Expo is coming up in May. We just got done at the the Tampa or the Florida RV Super Show, which I think I said on first episode, then like the second episode, then like the third episode. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, we're going to talk about RVs. And then it's like something else happens. I haven't been able to get to it. So I went down to the RV show, the Florida, Florida RV super show. And, um, we had a good time. It was, it was, well, we didn't, we did, but we didn't. Um, I was super under the weather. I thought it was just volleyball shenanigans and losing my voice, but it turned out I got home and ended up having a pretty nasty flu for a while. But, um, we shot 59 videos in two days. We covered everything, man. It's, it's the, the RV industry is so fun, right? It's so fun. Yeah. There's so many great RVs to look at. Um, you can dare to dream or you can get something now. You can get a travel trailer. You can get a class A diesel. You can get a class A gas. You can get a class B. You know, there's there's so much stuff to choose from. Um, and, and that's what I love the most uh, about. The, have, have you ever RV? Do you, have you ever had an RV? Did you grow so, up in an RV? Yeah. So, no, no. So, that brings up a great point. So, we did, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was RVing. It was... You know, glamping. we just kind of did not even really glamping, you know, we, we just did like, okay, there's a brand in LA called escaper camp escape camper vans. Yeah. And we did, we did camping for an event for a week and it was so Class freaking B. awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It was so cool. And the best part, and I know this sounds so simple, but maybe we're just simple people, but our favorite thing was literally pulling up at a campsite, laying, you know, getting everything out, get, being there overnight, waking up early the next morning and just cooking breakfast in the ice cold and just having this hot meal and just looking at nature. Like it was just so peaceful and so awesome. Yeah. yeah, It was cool. Yeah. And and actually my wife and I have talked about even getting into overlanding just to get that experience again, you know, taking the yeah. dogs, getting a tent on top of our vehicle, you know, just having fun. We did a 27. What's funny is, you know how we ended up in Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. We, we, had a so we started in a keystone cougar and it was a 32 foot pull behind double bunkhouse 
2002 Keystone Cougar that felt like it weighed 15,000 pounds. Like it was, <laughs> and, and when we bought it, I didn't know two, two, I don't want to finish what I was. I didn't know two craps about, uh, I didn't know much about travel trailers. I've camped since I was a little kid, but we picked it up in a, in a Chevy Tahoe, which had like not even close to the right rating to tow that thing. And I mean, we drove down the road. We were like those people that were driving down the road. It was like, like the whole thing was just, oh, it's so bad. So I sold, we sold the, the Chevy Tahoe and we got a, we got a, um, a Ford F-250. And from there, man, we traveled. So we traveled, we did a 27 day trip uh, on the West coast through Bend, Oregon, um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Grants Pass, Humboldt County, uh, over into, into Wyoming, Montana, uh, Jackson Hole, and then made our way back. Um, and that was over the course of a few weeks. And then we did it again a year later and we yeah. went, uh, or not a year later, two years later, we moved out this way, uh, to Tennessee and we ended up doing a big 27 day trip all over the Southeast, but we've been doing all this travel and we're trying to kind of figure out like, do we ever want to move out of California? Um, and we use the RV to kind of explore cities like Bend, Oregon, sure. and explore. Yeah. And we ended up not RVing here. We ended up flying here uh, for a party. And then we're like, yeah, hey, we'll live here. Now we RV out of here, which is, dude, if you have ever RVed in the South um, in the spring and fall, I don't think there's any other place that's more beautiful than this area. It's so awesome. Yeah. And you guys are kind of in a hub too, as far as what states to travel to, because you're like right in the center of all the good stuff. Yeah, it's good, man. We got Kentucky to the north. We got North and South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Alabama. Like, we got it all. <laughs> we talk about Arkansas, but not all that much. No offense, Arkansas. But we don't really go over there and camp. <laughs> right. um, but I hear there's some killer lakes there. So, yeah, it, it's awesome. Um, and, and we love doing it. We've got some good trips coming up this summer, too. We'll do one in a couple in a Class A, and we'll do some in a travel trailer. Well, our guest today is going to break it down for us. She is going to take us deep inside uh, the workings of the RV industry. Speaking of RVing, um, transitioning to our guest, and look who's joining the Mike Caudill podcast. Um, if you all don't know who Monica Dracy is, you need to. Um, she's She is like, like Queen Bee of the RV industry. Can we call think, you that? I think that's the official title, yeah. She is the spokesperson and director of PR and communication for Go RVing, but probably more importantly, or equally importantly, the RV Industry Association, which is, you know, the, 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 it's the, the organization that really helps keep all of us in line uh, when it comes to the wonderful world of RVs. Thank you for joining the show. Thank you for having me. And you know that we're actually friends because you're one of the few people who actually pronounced my name right, which love that. So um, thank you. Hey, there you go. That's, that makes me feel more at home. Yeah. 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 I, I think I butchered it once at the very beginning and somebody's like, it's Tracy. <laughs> so I was like, and it sounds like if, if it was Jirachi or Geraci, like Jirachi, like the Geraci sounds like so cool. It's like, yeah. An Italian restaurant or a, what is Tracy? How, what, what is that it's, background? It's Italian. I mean, I'm not Italian. It's my married name, but uh, yeah, it's Italian. Just tell everyone you're Italian. It's just always the best. It's like, I'm <laughs> Italian. Hey. Um, all right. So let's talk some RVs. And Harrison and I were talking a minute ago. He's talking about how his family used to rent an escape class B and they would, you know, go to the beach in California for a week. And he loved that. That's how they grew up. Of course, you know, for those listening to the, to the show for the first time uh, and tuning in, you know, I, I've been doing this my whole life. And I don't think they know that you and I have, you know, just via work, we've become good friends. And we've traveled together. We've been down to Tampa. We've been to Elkhart now a few times. And, and we've, you know, we've, we've done some really cool television and marketing work together, transparency for everybody. Uh, that's tuning in. I work super closely with Go RVing. I've been a spokesperson and a brand ambassador for them. Um, so you've seen me on television talking about the industry and the highs and the lows and all this fun stuff. What is your RV background? So I think one of the things we were just talking about when we were down in Tampa was both of us hanging out in Glamis. Um, I actually grew up in Southern California. Um, I 
I've RV'd my entire life, um, all up and down the West Coast. But some of my favorite memories was uh, going out to Glamis and having those four wheelers. Um, yeah, so that's it's always been a big part of of my life. And and for those listening, Glamis is a very special place in the California desert. Uh, it's just outside of Palm Springs. So if you Google the Salton Sea uh, and keep going east, it's off Highway 78. And Glamis is actually where they filmed uh, Star Wars. It was Empire Strikes Back when Jabba the Hutt uh, was out in the middle of a desert. And that desert was Glamis because it's all sand. It's beautiful sand oasis. Uh, no rocks. It's just all sand and it blows in every which direction. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. So we both share in that. Um, the RV industry has had an amazing five years. Um, you know, COVID is one of those things that it really, in you know, and, and we've talked about this in so many instances, you know, there's so much that's bad that happened 2019, 2021. But one of the things that was a kind of a blessing in disguise was the fact that people wanted to get away, they wanted to social distance themselves, and they wanted to stay with their family and their outlet was RVing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been, it was great for the RV industry. We had built more RVs in a single year than ever before. But what's really cool is that it's not even, you know, the RV industry has, has benefited, if you want to call it that. But what's been really incredible is just the change in people's attitudes right um in prioritizing getting outdoors of taking a step back you know and that really all comes from those depending on where you lived whether it was two weeks or six weeks or or months of not being able to leave your house and then just when you were finally able to go back outside and just walk to your city park or your neighborhood park or get out there and go RVing. It was just the outdoors was the safe space and it re almost reprogrammed how people have thought and prioritizing getting outdoors. And that's something, you know, when there was this spike in, in RV interest when in 2020 and even in 2021, when people couldn't even buy an RV, right? Like you want an RV, you went to the dealership and they're like, here are your two options. Um, and that was it. People were, oh, this is a fad. People aren't going to keep RVing, but it's been a change in people's just their attitudes and prioritizing getting outside and spending that time with friends and family, which is, let's be honest, just great for people in general. I remember somebody passing me some press release that was like, the RV industry has grown anywhere from 90 to 350% month over month. And it was like, you're right. Some dealers had no RVs uh, on their lot. I remember, you know, venturing down in, into downtown Nashville where we have RV row. It's all these different RV companies. And, you know, there, there were RVs on the lot, but man, there was not a lot to choose from. And, and so fast forward now today, um, going down to the, the Florida RV super show down in Tampa, I couldn't believe how many cool RVs, like it's almost like the RV makers listened to what consumers said coming out of COVID, like we would like more office space or we would like the ability to tuck our bicycles in a different place or we really want to make it have more of a uh, a person or personalized or customized feel on the inside, farmhouse style. Like it's amazing. What What is it that RV makers, like they've all taken away from this? Why are they so, like, is it just a shift in the industry to create more customization? There's definitely that. And there's just been the changing of who the consumer is. I mean, we saw particularly during um, the COVID times that the median age of a first time buyer dropped dramatically. It went from 41 in 2020 to 32 in 2022. Um, and that's compared to what people kind of think is a traditional RVer, which is maybe your grandma or grandpa. Um, and that's looking at all RVers. It is, the median age is about 54, 55. Um, but we know that the people who are coming in are much younger and a lot more diverse. When we're looking at people who are buying RVs today um, for the first time, it's almost exactly mirror census data. So. RV manufacturers are having to build for a younger, more diverse audience. And so it's listening to what the customer wants, having even more options. You know, there's always been a lot of options for RVs. We say there's an RV for every 
price point and lifestyle, but they're really, there's even more options now, um, especially the work from the road um, and schooling kids from the road. And then the remote work that just allows people to, you know, if, if I think we're both working from home right now, if you can work from, from home, you can also take it on the, on the road and work from an RV. And just so that increased flexibility, just the manufacturers have to meet that that growing and changing. Community. I remember Monica, and this is before I was actually working with an, a, an RV maker before I started working with go RVing. And I remember it's like five years ago, I was down at the Tampa RV, uh, RV show. And I was doing some, some video work in this and that. And the PR person for one of the brands was like, Hey, Hey, come check out this. We've got a workstation inside our RV. And I was like, Oh, this is so cool. And then like this last year, when I went to Elkhart, like everyone's like, check out the workstation. I'm like, yeah, that's boring. I've already seen that. It's been out for five years. Cause like everyone is moving in that direction. And what I find really interesting, and I couldn't agree with you more, right? The average age is now 32, what you were saying a minute ago. And I think RV makers are gearing up their RVs to really focus on hitting all of those various, you know, demographics, right? They're, they're creating these, these amazing units that give people more flexibility. Now, have you seen any, like, is there a specific like line item or delineated growth between class A's, B's, C's? Like, what are you seeing in the trends? Is it overlanding? Is it travel trailers? What are you seeing as, is like the trend? Yeah. A couple things on that. Um, so, and maybe everyone doesn't realize this, but about 85 to 90% of all RVs that are built are actually towables. People often think of the motorized, the motorhome, when they think of RVs, but that only makes up 10 to 15% of the market. But what's been really interesting in the motorized segment are the class B. So van life, van campers, and spoiler alert, class B RVs are just better uh, vans. Um, it's not just thrown in a, you know, DIY. These are built by manufacturers that they're, they're built to safety standards, but the increase in class B motorhomes, the, how many have been built has been crazy. When you look back just 15 years ago, there were less than 2000 class Bs built at all. And last year in 2023, there were 12,000. So wow. like the increase, okay. you know, this is still a very small part. Like I just said, it's only 10 to 15% is motorized and class C's are about a third of that. So it's still only about 3% of total RV shipments. But when you're talking about going from less than 2000 to over 12,000, um, that's an area that has really grown. Like it's people, whether it's the younger um, millennials or, or even Gen Zers who want to have something they can park in their driveway and just go and come back. Or we even have, um, you know, even older people who want to, again, just be, have something that's a little more drivable. And those ones are built. They're so nice. You did, you did a number of tours of these class B's. Um, and so those have been an area that have been really cool that it's just grown exponentially. Um, it's still a small part of the industry, but it's grown exponentially. Um, so that's one of the, one of the cool things that's happened. Over the past it's it's interesting, uh, with those class B's, I, I saw a class B, uh, down in Tampa that actually had a slide, right? Like a class B that actually has a slide that comes out now. It's, it's so crazy to see how innovative, um, some of these brands are becoming with, with the products they're bringing to market. Now on the automotive side of what I do. You know, I go to this big show in Las Vegas every year, this, this specialty equipment market association, the annual SEMA show. Everybody knows the kind of knows the SEMA show. And it used to be hot rods on carpet and big blown out engines and exhaust. And then over the last 10 years, it started with Jeeps. And then like it was the Gladiator and then it was the Bronco. And now we're talking all that, like there's a whole, the whole entire West Hall is all overlanding and off-roading. Is that, is that becoming like smaller, like the ROG? Is that becoming a small, like a big, is that becoming a new core uh, in the industry is getting off, off grid? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a spectrum of what we're seeing in that area. Number one, like just look cooler. So there's on, on one end, you've got just some more off-road boondocking overland type features, bigger tires, like more rugged exterior. That's on just like, kind of the cosmetic side that just looks cooler. So we've been seeing that. 
but all the way to there was a there's a newer manufacturer ember rv that were built just for that in the off-roading boondocking overlanding um and then went and added some that are more for like the campground so yeah it's 32 years old right they're they're looking to get off grid um you know one thing that is always interesting you know in the auto industry and we, harris and i were talking about this earlier is that i always get asked what's your favorite car Right. And I'm like, how am I supposed to answer what my favorite car is? Like you have an hour, you have two hours, you have a day, like this could take forever. And I get the same thing in the auto, in the RV industry as well. People ask like, all right, well, what's your favorite RV? And, you know, I always tell everybody that, you know, I can, I can push you in a, in a certain direction, whichever way, like I, I can convince you to get a class A or, or a towable, but your website, especially on the go RVing side, which for those the Go RVing site is a consumer-facing site of the RV Industry Association. It's resources. It has everything that you need to know about a Class A, a Class B, a Class C. What's the difference between a Class A diesel pusher or a Class A uh, gas puller? Where is it? Pe like, how do people start RVing? But is there a way to do it on the cheap? Like, if you want to do it for the first time, can you can you rent an RV? Like, can you? Or or you buy one, do you have, like, how's that all work? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to get started. Um, and that's what the Go RVing website, that's what we're here for. Go RVing does not sell any RVs. Um, I have no RVs to sell you. We're really just trying to share the benefits and information about the RVing lifestyle. Go RVing has fantastic resources. Everyone loves an online quiz to help you get started in, in help that direction of motorized, towable, what features you're, you're looking for. But there are RVs that are can be very inexpensive. Um, RVs can be financed for 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the, the loan. So you can get RVs for a very affordable payment. So, um, and then there is renting. So if you really don't know exactly what kind of RV you want, because that's one of the biggest questions, right? Do you want to be able to drive it? Um, or, and then you get somewhere and then maybe you have to have a tow vehicle, like a, a car that you're towing behind your motorized to get around. Um, or do you want a towable that then you'll be able to detach and, and go wherever. Um, but then you're in your, your tow vehicle, right? I grew up motorhome family, like, you know, being able to travel in the motorhome, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing like it. There's um, nothing like it. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, I'm one of five that all, all of us definitely wore seatbelts the entire time. I have to say that now, but like. <laughs> Man, they didn't even exist back then. <laughs> happened in the last century. We like, yeah. you know, this is different, yeah. different, different time, different time, different time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm I'm all off. Uh, what, what are we talking about here? I so, love that I was totally able to get you off track. How did how did you get Monica off track on the podcast? I just mentioned seatbelts and RVs, and she lost it. She did. No, she did. yeah, we we're just you know in, we were just talking in general about um, the the fun of a class A, right? <laughs> No, because this is this is actually really important. Is that you do if you don't know what you want, um, because it is a big decision to to make. There's really nice RVs, and, and while you can get affordable ones, you can also spend a, a pretty penny on them. So if you're really like, I don't know what I want, there are a lot of ways to rent them, and the peer to peers are one of the best ways because it's it's like an Airbnb of RVing. So if you want to go try a towable, um, yeah, that's cool. you're like are comfortable driving it, or you're like, I really, I want to take that road trip and be in a, a motorized. It's a great way to get started. And one of the cool things that's coming up and these numbers have been crazy is, so the solar eclipse that's coming up on April 8th for a big part of the, the country, um, the rental companies, outdoorsy RV share are seeing over a thousand percent increase oh. in people renting Dang. RVs for the solar eclipse. And we just did a survey and there are 14.1 million Americans who are planning to go RVing to watch the solar eclipse. That's on a Monday. Like over 14 million people are like, yep, I'm going to go RVing to watch this, this solar eclipse. I need to get planning. I did not know this. <laughs> April 8th. That is cool. 
I, I, I work with a colleague that is a huge stargazer. Like she is all about things happening in the atmosphere, like in space. And she didn't tell us. Tracy, make sure we talk to Kristen about the fact that she did not inform us of this. We will we will do that. Um, I, okay, so you guys too. Like you guys are gonna be, I think, pretty close to the the totality. We will we will check into that. Um, so what what's happening now? What's new? What's what's in store for the future of the RV industry? Like, are sales good? Where are we moving? Like, are I, I know things are good. Like, and I, I follow all the stats and numbers. Like, we're at solid pre COVID numbers. Um, the industry seems to be pretty healthy. Yeah. So, I mean, COVID was crazy for everyone, right? There were, like we talked about, you couldn't get an RV. Our manufacturers did the best they could to to restock and then make sure that there were those options on, on dealer lots. And so there's, you know, our, who we represent, which are the manufacturers who build RVs. So there's the production and then there's the sales and, and a little, little off balance there for a little while, but we're, we're getting back in balance um, just this week, releasing our forecast. And we're looking to produce about 15% more RVs this year than, than last year. So we're not, we're not breaking any records, but the trends are going in the, the right direction. And it looks like we're going to be able to get that, that balance between um, sales and production so that consumers have a great uh, variety and choices on dealer lots um, and bring a little, little stability to that. I know right now is like big RV, I call it auto show, but RV show season. I, we just had ours here in Nashville. Uh, you and I were down at, at the one in Tampa. And that's definitely a good way for consumers. If they don't want to go to a dealership and, and look at them, that's one way to do it. Um, can we talk about the sticker? The seal? Sure. Yes. Okay. So every RV, and this is for, for everyone listening in, like if you want to know that an RV has been through a certain, it fulfills a certain criteria for safety and all that. Monica, tell them why the seal is so important and where they can find it. Yeah. So, I mean, back to something I mentioned a little earlier, one of the, the biggest comparisons is, so look at the Class B market. So you've got van campers that someone can just build and it's not built to any safety standard. Someone just throws a couch in the back, which are very cool. We love people getting outdoors and experiencing, but those aren't built to, to safety standards. The RV industry, there are um, NFPA 1192. That is the standard for RVs. And to be part of what the RV Industry Association does is we have a team of inspectors who go to all of the plants and inspect the line um, to make sure that these RVs are being built to those safety, the, the life systems, propane, electric, plumbing, the things that you really want to make sure are, are built correctly and safely. That's what our team makes sure is being done. And then those manufacturers self-certify that they are building those RVs to those safety standards. And there's a seal that goes on the side. It's usually by the door. It says RV Industry Association RV Industry Association on it. And it says that it's this unit has been built to those safety standards. And, you know, we want everyone to be safe. We want to make sure that you're in units that are built to the latest and greatest safety standards. And by making sure that you're in a unit that has one of those seals is going to, should give you some, some good peace of mind. I grew up in the RV industry. We had a Volkswagen Westphalia. We moved into a Keystone Cougar. We went from the Cougar to a camp. My wife and I camped for a few years before we could afford to do any of it. Then we got a Keystone Cougar. Our kids have been camping since they were babies. We then moved into a Thor Hurricane, Winnebago, Forza, Thor Magnitude, Thor Thor. We, we love Thor. Um, but we moved into a Magnitude, had the Winnebago Forza. Um, there's nothing like creating memories in an RV. Where can people learn more? Um, I, and I, I just want to say this, I work with, choose to work with go RVing and I, and I have, you know, I, I'm lucky because I get to work with a variety of different companies, but I believe in what go RVing and the RV industry association does one. It protects people by putting the seal on RVs that say, look, this is a safe unit for you to be in Two, If you go to the consumer facing side of, of go RVing. One, it has all kinds of fun content to look at. Recipes for on the road, tri tips, tricks, and hacks. Um, there's backgrounders on RVs. If you go back to, to, I mean, once a week, we're putting a video up of, of videos that I've actually toured uh, and done demos on down, at, down in Tampa. 
uh, is that that's the place to go, right? Go to go that, RVing. I mean, it can get you if you are RV curious. This is a new term I've I've coined this year. It's one of my my favorite new terms. Is like if you're just like I don't even know what I don't know. That's the resource that go RVing is is there for. Like that very intro. What there's about RVs. What are the different types of RVs? And there's cool little like. You can look at the inside of them, but just that very intro level, but also we've got trip planning. We've got expert advice, you know, how to winterize. If you want to start doing some of that stuff a little bit more, we, we have a varying level of, um, of, of advice. And so we're really there to be that one-stop shop for people who are looking for more information on RVs. And then we also are a resource for you to find the the manufacturer or the dealer near near you that can make your RV dreams come true. All right. Thank you, my friend. I will see you soon. Absolutely. Thank All right. you for having me. Bye, Monica. Bye. Good conversation with, with Monica. Um, dude, you got to get an RV. Forget the next car. Just get an RV and get out there on the open road. That's what you yeah. got to do. Yeah. Uh, all right, gang, it has been a, this is a long one. Um, I'm looking at our timestamp and we're currently sitting at an hour and 33 minutes with episode number six. I'm going to have somebody who's going to be like, dude, you need to shut your trap. Um, <laughs> so, hey, I'm off to uh, Palm Springs next week to drive the Lincoln Nautilus. You'll meet me there. Yes. The next week I will be in Salt Lake City driving the Ford Ranger Raptor. You will not see me there. I will um, not. I will be there without you. And then we're off to the New York Auto Show for a full six days of some fun television shenanigans. Um, let's talk before we get to the ride of the week. Uh, did you eat anything fun this week? Yeah, we did. We had steaks at home, baked potatoes, Caesar salad. It's like an incredible classic meal. Super good. Right, you need to tell us about the sushi that you have because. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, sushi. You sushi. This week? I had steak at home. You, you texted me it was like 10 30 now you're like dude i'm eating sushi right now and i'm like that's great the sushi was super good we had a combination of fresh rolls we had deep fried rolls and then we had sashimi and uh, i tried sashimi for the first time and i had salmon sashimi and it was really really good of course really it is. Good. sushi's amazing yeah. uh mine is the lime deli right here in the, the square public square in gallatin uh it is a little hole in the wall deli uh, the, the the square here in gallatin is a little interesting like there's a, there's a, the main courthouse is like the centerpiece of down. It's, it's not, they need to move that out. Um, but that's where all the lawyers go. So I had a pulled turkey sandwich. That's right. Pulled turkey, not pulled oh, pork, turkey. not pulled beef, not pulled brisket, pulled turkey. And dude, they put this cheese on it and then they put it, it's like a panini. Dude, it is the bomb. So that's my shout out for food of the week. And we'll close it out with this. How much horsepower? 505. All right, so this week's test drive is a vehicle that I'm sad to say will be going away next year. And when it returns, it will likely be hybridized. Hybridized? Is that a word? Hybridized. Hybridized. It'll be hybridized, or it'll be electric, and that's the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifolio, which is their high-end performance version. Carbon fiber roof, carbon fiber uh, accents all the way around, rear deck lid, uh, spoiler. This thing is amazing. Performance seats on the inside. Even comes with an ambulance siren that passes yes. by your window. It's that good. Um, dude, I will tell you, this car is one of the most written off, not discussed, most fun to drive, powerful BMW, Mercedes M, AMG fighting vehicles on the market. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is a quick car, a lot of luxury, and I'm sad to see it go because I feel like the yep. potential was there to keep making it more awesome and badass. Yep. So do you know where, and this is how we're going to close the show, um, and then Tracy's going to be like, I cannot believe you said that on air, but I'm going to do it because it's the facts. <laughs> um, so the Alfa Romeo logo. Yes. Do you know what? If Now pull it up. If you have your computer, you got to pull it up. I'm telling everybody at home, pull up the Alfa Romeo logo. Yep. On the left side of the logo, you're going to see a red cross. That cross represents the city of Milan. I've been there. The, on the other side is a serpent, a snake. It's like called a cone. And that snake serpent at the very tip of its mouth has what looks to be a person. And the logo is a cross on one side and a grass snake eating a kid. 
that's how they describe the logo. Wow. Yeah, you're freaking out right now. You're thinking I'm yeah. full. Of, you're thinking I'm full of BS. No, I'm just like I guess yeah. I've never noticed it. <laughs> yeah, no one's ever noticed that. It's a good social media video. Um, all right, gang, that's a long one. That's a wrap for today. This is a lot of un- like Tracy. Am I missing anything? We're good to go. We're gonna move some stuff to next week. We'll talk about getting geared up for uh, the season on the next show. You'll want to come back for that when we're gonna talk about how to get your truck dialed in. Um, some really cool companies we're going to talk about. Uh, Harrison, take us to close. Taking you to close. I've got a pretty good joke that I was sitting on this whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> I found out my wife was cheating on me. She sent me you a did? text and said, I'll be home in 15 minutes, Max. My name's not Max. Oh my God. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mike Caudill podcast. <laughs> hey, thanks for tuning in, everybody. As always, thank you to my podcast partner in crime, Harrison OBH, old boy Harrison Noble, yes, for sir. joining us joining us today. Um, if you're not following me on my social media channels, please do. It's Mike Caudill on Instagram. It's Mike Caudill on Facebook. It's Mike Caudill on YouTube and TikTok. Maybe I should get a Snapchat. I don't know. We'll see you guys next time. Take care, guys.